In this video, I want to share some ways that you can be better with HTML and CSS. And the things I'm going to share with you in this video are what I like to call low-hanging fruit. These are really high-impact things that don't take a ton of effort. So let's get started. The first thing you can do, and this is kind of a big one because this is going to underpin a lot of the other stuff we're going to talk about, is use less or SAS. And both of these are technologies that are called CSS preprocessors. At least for the purpose of this video, it doesn't matter which you choose because both of them do all the same basic core stuff. What's really nice about Lesson SAS is it's easy to get started because all valid CSS is also valid Lesson SAS. So if you want to get started with this, all you got to do is get the Lesser SAS compiler, rename your CSS file to less, and then compile it, and you're done. The big thing that Lesson SAS does is it allows you to treat CSS almost as if it were a programming language. Lesson SAS, they implement things like functions, things like importing, and all kinds of other stuff. The big thing that it allows you to do is do nested CSS styles, which is very great for maintaining large numbers of styles. So consider this piece of HTML on the screen. It's an outer div with a class outer and then an inner h2. So if you wanted to style the h2 tag only, what you would normally write is dot outer to reference the outer div and then h2, curly brace, and then you could do whatever you want, font size 40. What Lesson SAS allows you to do is you can take this h2 style, put curly braces on the outer, and paste the h2 into the outer. Now obviously this on its own is not valid CSS, however, when Less compiles that particular style, it's going to convert it to a CSS compatible version, which will look like the original version, which is just dot outer space h2. The next thing is to consider using a component type framework, and some examples of these are React, Vue.js, Angular, Polymer, and many others. Frameworks that are built on components have benefits for both HTML and CSS. They allow you to produce these small, reusable components that are comprised of some HTML, maybe some nested HTML, and possibly even some scripting. However, another big thing they allow for is scoped CSS, meaning that you can bake the CSS for that component directly into the component, and the framework will make sure that that style is only applied to that component. And this is very powerful because one of the main th problems with an HTML and CSS project, if none of these tools are in use, is CSS styles stepping on top of each other. There's CSS styles that are used to style something on one page, but since they are applied globally for all pages, they end up affecting another page. And this problem can very quickly get out of hand. Just to show you an example, we're going to look at the Vue.js documentation, and not for any other reason besides their documentation isn't trying to burn my eyeballs with light theme. The way that they do it is very simple. You put everything in a .view file, and in there is a script tag that contains the scripts that are specific to that component. There is a template which contains the HTML that's for that component, and then there is a style tag which contains the style for that component. Now you'll notice that button here is just button. They haven't specified which button, and that's because they don't need to. Vue.js is going to take care of that for you, and it's going to make sure that this class for button is only going to be applied to stuff inside of this template. Doing it this way completely eliminates any possibility of CSS styles stepping on top of each other. Next thing is to use scoped CSS, and now this will only apply to people who are not using a component type framework. This is people who maybe just want to use less and not use anything else. The whole idea behind scope CSS is just to make sure that CSS styles don't spill into other places. So if you look at this HTML, we have an outer div with a class called section one. Inside of this div, we have three elements, each with their own various classes, header, description, and avatar. Now say you wanted to make that h2 element bold. It would be really tempting to do something like this, dot header, font weight bold. The problem with this is, although it does style that particular header as bold, it also styles anything in your entire project with the header class as bold. And the same thing is true, of course, for description and avatar, because all of these are very common class names, header, description, avatar. You don't want to reserve them just for this one place, because you're invariably going to use these elsewhere. So the solution here is, using less is to scope all of those other stuff under section one. So to do that, you can do dot section one, curly brace, and you can put all your stuff in here. So if you want to style header, you do it there. If you want to style description, you can do it there. And if you want to style you know, any images, you can do it like that. 
Now, because this is under section one, it's only going to style those class names or those element names that fall under section one. Now, of course, you do wanna make sure that section one is unique across your entire project. The next thing you can do is use consistent naming, and this is a pretty simple thing, and this mostly refers to the naming of IDs and classes for HTML and CSS. The most important thing here is just that you do it the same throughout your entire project. It's not super important that you do it any particular way. If you want to use hyphens, that's great. If you want to use underscores, that's great. If you want to use a blend of them, that's great, as long as it is consistent across your entire project. Me personally, I use hyphens for all of my CSS classes. The next thing is to use tables only for tabular data. Now there was a point in the past where all layouts for all websites pretty much were built using exclusively tables. Keep in mind this was long before things like Flexbox and CSS Grid existed, so that really was the best way, and that's why people did it. Now I don't think this is super common for people to be doing that, but I have came across projects that are still using tables for something other than tabular data. The next thing, this is a really simple one, is to avoid deprecated HTML elements. Now just a warning, I'm about to burn your eyeballs with Mozilla's site. They have a list of all elements that you can look at on their site. And on the left hand side of their site is all the HTML elements. Now some of these have a red trash can. What these denote are elements that were used in the past or maybe they were introduced into the standard but they're in the process of being deprecated. And the whole purpose of not using these is just to future proof your application because eventually these are not going to be supported and they might not even be rendered anymore. So if you're still relying on the center tag, for instance, as a way to center elements or text, one day it's not going to center anything because the browser is just simply not going to support that tag. So if you get a moment, have a look at this list and I'll leave a link in the description so you can check it out and just make sure anything with the trash can or the thumbs down you are not using. And last but not least is use open graph meta tags for your HTML files. And again, retina burn warning. For those of you who are not familiar with the Open Graph protocol, this was something that was originally created by Facebook as a way to create rich embeds from any website that was on the internet. Now, although this was originally created by Facebook, it has pretty much been adopted by everyone as an open protocol for making these rich you know, embeds on these various platforms. If you've ever pasted a link into Discord or pasted a link into Facebook or Instagram or Twitter or any of these other sites and noticed that it just magically got the title of the site and the description and the image and the URL, well, this is exactly how that happened. Using these four properties, supplying a title, a type, URL, and image is a really quick thing you can do and really quick tags you can add to your site to ensure that when somebody shares them or it's pasted on these platforms that support this, that it shows up in a really rich way as opposed to just a link. I'll leave a link to this site in the description as well in case you want to check it out further. And that's everything for this video. Most of these are really quick things you can do to just level up your HTML and CSS game. If you have any questions at all about anything you saw in this video, please leave them below in the comments. Thanks a lot for watching, and I'll see you in the next video. Take care.